cue in our intro. Should be live. Um, go step the dog outside. <laughs> Should have did that already. We've got Graham Phillips with us. I'm very excited. How are you doing, Graham? Thanks for coming. I'm very excited. I haven't got a dog here, but I've got a cat somewhere. Oh, yeah, somewhere. that's probably what he saw was our cat. That's probably why he started barking. <laughs> All right. I'm so happy to talk to you because you have so many books. You have so many, um, you know, good topics in your books. I can't wait to ask you about every one of them. And, um, uh, our audience is coming in. Hi, everybody. Cool. Okay. So let me go ahead and just start out. Tell us how you got started in, uh, you know, writing. And I know you've been a guest on the BBC and TV shows. If you want to just tell us how it all started in a little intro, uh, let us know and we'll get going. Well, it all started back in 1979, which is before probably most of the people that are watching this were born. And um, I used to be an editor of a magazine called Strange Phenomena, and it was based in the centre of England. And the idea was to investigate the paranormal and various mysteries of all kinds. And I was a journalist before that. I used to work for the BBC as a, as a reporter. Um, on BBC Radio and so when I moved into doing this thing about the paranormal and the unexplained it was a completely new step for me I hadn't really been interested in that sort of thing before but when that magazine finished in the early 80s it had just got me really interested in investigating strange and unsolved mysteries and the first thing that I investigated on my own outside of the magazine was um, an historical mystery concerning the the British Queen, Mary Queen of Scots, who died in the 1580s. And she was supposed to have had this ring, this very expensive ring that she wore on her finger, like a, a kind of signet ring. And this was worth a fortune it was hidden somewhere in the english countryside and one of mary queen of scots's um servants had left a series of clues somewhere in this old elizabethan manor house and eventually we managed to discover in this old elizabethan house hidden behind the walls behind wooden paneling there was a series of paintings that it turned out in the end held the clues as to where this ring of Mary's Queen of Scots wow. was hidden. Um, and it, basically when we found this thing, um, I was so excited that uh, my first book got published about it. It was called The Green Stone because the ring had a green stone in it that was said to hold miraculous powers. Um, I don't know about the miraculous powers, but the whole thing was so exciting. It got me hooked. and. Thereafter, I started writing books about generally historical mysteries, although the paranormal did sometimes come into it. That's my favorite topic. Uh, history, even ancient history, and mixing it in with the strange or the paranormal. So that's so cool. Um, so you found the ring then. And uh, we can't, what did it look like? I have to ask. I know you said it had a green stone. Well, we didn't actually oh. find the ring. It was just the stone oh, we found in okay. the end, unfortunately. Okay. But what was amazing, it was actually hidden in a brass casket 
about so big that was buried in the ground and it was literally all covered in years of silt and sediment and when it was taken to a museum nearby and the curators had it cleaned up and opened uh, firstly they dated it to being it they, they said it had been in the ground for over 400 years um, so it really I mean it really did date from the right period and Unfortunately, there was only a stone inside, a green stone, which couldn't itself be dated, but it matched. It was a jade stone and matched exactly the paintings where Mary Queen of Scots is shown wearing this ring with this stone in it. So it seemed to have been the stone that was considered to be really important for the followers of Mary Queen of Scots. It somehow represented her right to rule Britain, but uh, she never managed it because she had her head chopped off by Elizabeth okay. I. It was the I Queen of England. Here, okay, I've read about but anyway, that. I've read about question. that. Honestly, that's so interesting. Okay, so um, you you worked for the BBC, so you uh, obviously you said, and um, I know you were on Ancient Aliens. Can you tell us just about you know both of those experiences? And uh, I wanted to hear maybe like some of the topics you talked about on Ancient Aliens and stuff too, if yet if you can. Oh, yeah, I've been on that loads of times. They've just got me on for the latest series. They had me down in London doing a series of interviews twice oh, this year. I think I've pretty much been in every series they've ever had at some point. But I'm not the one who goes on and talks about ancient aliens. What they come to me for is the historical background to a certain mystery. And I lay that mystery out for them. And then they get guys coming on and saying, well, you know, I think this was an oh, alien. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I... I you know, I make no comments on whether I think it was aliens or not. For example, I've written a book about King Arthur, which came out recently, um, about King Arthur may have been an historical figure. Uh, it's called The Lost Tomb of King Arthur. So I went searching for where he may have been buried if he existed. But as part of this book, I also researched the mystery of Excalibur, the sword that Arthur was supposed to have had that made him invincible. And the ancient aliens really liked this idea and they thought, OK, what about if this sword that made Arthur invincible was really some alien weapon mm. of some kind? Now, I let them say that bit. I simply went on and said, this is the legend about King Arthur and that he had a sword. And I think that it may have been an historical item. In other words, there really was something behind this legend. Now, we all know in the story of King Arthur, at the end, when he's dying on the field of battle, he asks one of his knights to throw the sword into a nearby lake. And when he does so, the arm of the Lady of the Lake, this mysterious nymph-like mermaid type creature who lives in the lake, grabs the sword by the hills and takes it down into the watery depths. Now, that, of course, sounds like it might have just been made up during the Middle Ages as a fanciful tale. But what's fascinating is in the around about the year 500, when Arthur is said to have lived, there was a custom in Britain amongst the Celtic people that when a warrior was being buried, they would throw his or her, because many Celtic warriors were women, sword into a a stretch of water which was considered to be sacred to a Celtic goddess. And I think that it's a good possibility that this funerary rite, where they were throwing a sword into the water, into a sacred pool as, as an offering to a goddess, became later exaggerated to the story of the sword being grabbed by this mysterious creature called the Lady of the Lake. And the real piece of evidence that I had to suggest that the two things were tied together was that the Celtic water goddess was named Viviana, and the Lady of the Lake in the Arthurian legend is called oh, Vivian. Okay. In other words, I believe one was based on the other. So on the Ancient Alien program, I, I stated this, and then they could then go off and bring in somebody else to say why they thought that this might be an alien artifact, or why the ancient Lady of the Lake, this Celtic goddess, may have been an yeah. alien. But that's, that was up that's to That's one thing about it. That's the kind of thing I do. With yeah, they, when I watch it, I always do that in my head. Uh, you know, they say, well, it could be aliens. I'm like, well, it could be a lot of things. But yeah, you, you, I always let that part kind of slide for me. That, you know, but I love the show. And, you know, I, I like the whole what if concept that not a lot of shows do that right now, you know, so. 
but oh no it's fascinating i think i mean it it's been well, i think it's 12 series oh, it's yeah. had going so i mean it's obviously extraordinarily popular okay we have a book that one of my friends on youtube that you that you wrote uh just loves and it had to do with uh i i don't want to say it wrong but i thought it had to do with julius caesar am i saying that right oh, that's what you're right? saying yeah, and then Julius one about Caesar. Shakespeare. I'm sorry to ask you two at once, but if you can just describe those or both for us really quick, and I'll I'll see if she's she's in the chat. So I'm going to see if she wants to ask you a question too. So yeah, tell us about those uh, if you have a chance here. Well, I've never written a book about Julius Caesar. I wrote a book about Alexander okay. the Great, and historians debate whether or not Alexander the Great, who was Greek. Or Julius, or Julius Caesar, who was Roman, was the greatest general in history. So I've researched Julius Caesar to some degree as part of the book about uh, Alexander the Great. But I have written a book about Shakespeare. It's called The Shakespeare Conspiracy. And it's all about the mysteries surrounding the life of William Shakespeare. What are some of the conspiracies involved? Uh, if you don't mind telling us. I don't, you know, you don't have to detail your whole Yeah, book, sure. But... Well, this was actually... This I wrote this book back in the uh, 1990s before the word conspiracy became a dirty <laughs> word. Um, I mean, conspiracy now kind of means fake news. But back then, you know, people like these titles of conspiracies. The conspiracy isn't so much a case of um, an actual people sitting down and deciding we're going to make Shakespeare something he's not. It's more a case of a conspiracy that people quietly went about creating a life of William Shakespeare. To, if you look at it this way, the best way of explaining it is that everybody knows about William Shakespeare and his role in English literature. How many other playwrights can most people name from history? They'd probably, you know, name another English playwright from English history. Most people would say something like Oscar Wilde or George Bernard Shaw or Sheridan. They all happen to be Irish. Shakespeare is one of the only people that comes to mind. Everybody knows him. And he's become the most famous character associated with English literature and almost become a sort of patron saint of the English language. And many legends, if you like, were written about in the life of Shakespeare as if they were fact. For example, it is said that he was born on St. George's Day, the 23rd of April. Now, St. George just so happens to be the patron saint of England. So, how come the supposedly patron saint of the English language, William Shakespeare, just so happened to be born on the same date as the patron saint of England? Well, when you look into the story, you'll find that Shakespeare wasn't born on that date at all. It was something that was just added later on. And then to make it even better, they decided he ought to die on that day too. There are many things about William Shakespeare that are simply added into his life later on to make him this... In some ways, Shakespeare's become as, mytholog as mythological or as mythologized as King Arthur or Robin Hood or any people that we normally think of as just legendary. Well, you mentioned Robin Hood just now, so that's a good way to kind of uh, slide over to your book about Robin Hood. What what uh, what did you bring up in the in the book you wrote about uh, Robin Hood? Again, like my research into King Arthur, it was an attempt to find out if there was a real figure behind the legend of Robin Hood. And it's fascinating because there does appear to have been. Now, nobody before me had actually really picked up on somebody from history who could have been a real Robin Hood. There have been a few suggestions. And people have said, well, why? How come no one else found out? And how come you did? Well, the answer is that it seemed that everybody else had been looking in the wrong place and at the wrong time period. Now, according to the legend we now know today that's on the big screen and you get people like Kevin Costner playing the role of Robin Hood, he lived during the reign of Richard I, which is around about 11, in the 1190s, when the King Richard I of England was in the Holy Land fighting the Crusades. And he'd left in charge of Britain his rather treacherous brother, Prince John. And when Prince John was ruling the country, he ordered his various tax collectors, which were the sheriffs around the country, to collect money from the, the people. And certain ruthless sheriffs, such as the Sheriff of Nottingham, were taxing the people too much. And eventually Robin Hood, 
uh, made a stand against the Sheriff of Nottingham, and Nottingham's in the centre of England, and the area around it, Sherwood Forest, is where he made his camp, and he robbed the rich who travelled the roads through the the forest, the tax collectors, he took the money from them and he gave it to the poor. Now, anyone who's looked for an historical Robin Hood that may have been behind the legend has looked in the period of the 1190s and in the area of Nottingham. But what I discovered is that the very earliest Robin Hood story to survive says that Robin existed in the 1200s sorry in the 1300s not the 1100s in fact in the 1320s and that he came from yorkshire which is just north of nottinghamshire and about 50 or 60 miles north of where the story we know today places him so it was in that area that i decided to search for an historical robin hood and eventually found a grave which had been marked the Robin Hood, or at least in the medieval spelling, Robert, which is a, Robin is in fact a nickname for somebody called Robert, and Hood spelled H-U-D-E because there was no standardised spelling in English until the 1700s. And um, this grave, what was so incredible about it, it was overgrown in the middle of woodland. And about a few hundred yards away, there was a gatehouse of a ecclesiastical medieval building called Kirkley's Priory, which still stands, although it's a ruin. And in legend, it is said that when Robin died, he sat in the wind before he was before he died, when he was an old guy, he sat in a window of a place called Kirkley's Priory and shot his arrow out of the window. And where it landed, he asked little John to bury him. And this place really called Kirkley's Priory only lies within an arrow shooting oh, wow. distance of um, of this of this priory and I was absolutely astonished to find that nobody had actually looked around that area to see if they could find his that's tomb. That's fascinating. I'm gonna have to read the book because that's just I love Robin Hood. It's one of my favorite uh, old stories and that's just that's just awesome. Um, okay, I, I wanted to ask you about the uh, end of Eden. Also, um, I haven't read the uh, uh, foreword in the book or the, you know the the summary of it. Um, so I was just wondering what you wrote, and um, you know if there's any details of it you want to let us know before we move on to other subjects. Yeah, the end of Eden is uh, investigation into something that happened around about. 1500 BC, that is three and a half thousand years ago, suddenly very many peace-loving civilizations throughout the world, in Central America, in Asia, and in the Middle East, suddenly abruptly started fighting each other. The Egyptians started fighting the Hittites from Turkey. The Chinese started fighting uh, kingdoms in India, in Central America. The Olmecs started fighting amongst one another and civilizations were virtually brought to their knees. And I kind of thought there must be something that caused this to happen all over the world in places that had no connection with each other. I called the book The End of Eden because before this time, you've got a relative period of peace throughout the world in different civilizations. And then from 1500 onwards, you've got the rise of empires and fighting and warfare. Hence, the end of Eden, the end of a time of tranquility and the beginning of a time of strife and misery. And I thought something must have happened, not just in one area of the world, but affected the whole world. And it turned out that in that year, astronomers have, have calculated that a comet came very, very close to Earth. Part of it broke off and this caused what we'd now call a nuclear winter. In other words, the dust and the debris thrown up by this fragment of the comet that, that hit the Earth caused a kind of mini version of the sort of thing that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago when an asteroid hit, but that was very much bigger. But it caused a period of famine and it caused a period of, of cold around the world where uh, people found that 
that the normal uh, that because crops failed and so forth and life was disrupted um, people began to become very much more possessive of their own land and 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 uh, supplies and this is what started the period of warfare and what I found fascinating is that all over the world in Egypt in tombs for example you have depictions of this great big uh, ball of light that was seen in the sky um, with numerous tails coming from it because some comets don't just have one tail we've seen some in recent years that have, have come close to earth that have got two or three tails this one had ten tails and it literally was the size because it came so close to earth and was so large it was the size of the full moon as we would see it in the sky and because people were so absolutely gobsmacked by this new thing that appeared in the sky it began new religions and very many religions including uh, new ones in Egypt and in China and in Central America started to worship this disc shaped thing with lines underneath it that's how they depicted it on tomb paintings and on pyramids and so forth um they started worshiping this thing and ever since people have or archaeologists and historians in recent times have assumed these were depictions of the sun and that these people all became sun worshippers but my belief is based on the research that i've done is that what they were depicting they weren't worshiping the sun they were worshiping this comet that almost destroyed the earth in other words they thought it was the appearance of a new god in the heavens that's what the end of eden's about in that's summary fascinating i see that i've seen that disc so so many different places just in pictures um i can see it in my head right now on the egyptian uh, walls of the pyramids that's that's very fascinating ten tails I wonder that would look so so great in the sky the largest one in, in in the largest comet or the one with the most tails in recent history was a seven tail comet that appeared in 1744 but that's going to be bigger than oh, any of those sure. wow oh man that kind of puts some pieces together you know in my head you know because you hear about so many wars that happened and i asked myself the same question you know what made everybody start fighting so much back then that's so cool once they're all caught religion they kept fighting on and on it and seemed, on i was gonna say that too i was gonna ask you if you thought the fighting has continued on into now because it seems that way might have been the last time of peace well a lot of the a lot of the world's major religions have uh, uh, actually all started off at that time i wonder why they don't tell us about that <laughs> well i don't <laughs> Well, I don't think, as far as I know, until I wrote my book, nobody had really taken much notice of it. But then again, no one's taken much notice of my book since it came out. What I tend to find is it takes about 20 years for the things that I write and other people like me to get into the kind of to get into the public imagination. And then afterwards, historians and archaeologists in the academic community suddenly say, well, it's, this theory has been out there long enough now and the guy hasn't been ripped to pieces, we can start claiming it as our own. You know? That's what I tends could, to happen. I could, I could understand that too. It does seem like that happens. Uh, in fact, you know, when did you write that book? When was, when, what year was it written? Oh, that one's only, that was only written about five okay. or six years ago. So I've got about, I'll, I'll be dead before <laughs> that one. <laughs> yeah, and it, it does definitely seem like uh, people's minds are opening a lot just in the last couple years we've seen. So, you know, maybe people will start a, looking deeper into those things too um you've got a few other books um that i i'm looking at the titles i really don't know uh much about it the, the marion conspiracy if i'm saying it correctly uh and the chalice of uh i am magladine or magdalene okay magdalene. magdalene okay yeah the, the chalice of magdalene that is um all about the holy grail magdalene being mary magdalene you know the the the, the, the woman who was uh, was a follower mm -hmm. of jesus she appears in the in the bible um she is said to have had a the bible tells us that she had this small chalice this small cup which was an ointment jar a, a scent jar which she used to anoint jesus with, with the scent from it that she used to anoint jesus's body when he was in the tomb after the crucifixion and this item in early christian times became a holy relic people thought that it they should try and find mary magdalene's um, alabaster cup as they called it because it said it's made from a form of 
green alabaster. And people believe that if they got this cup, because Mary Magdalene being a saint and had it, if they drank from it, they could become immortal or it could cure them of all ills. And this was known as the Chalice of Magdalene. Now, what's interesting is there's another cup associated with Jesus, and that is what's known as the Holy Grail. Most people refer to it as the Holy Grail. And that was the chalice or the cup said to have been used by Jesus during the Last Supper, just before he was crucified. And one of his followers, a man called Joseph of Arimathea, is said to have used this cup to collect a few of drops of Jesus's blood when he was on the cross. And afterwards, this cup became imbued with spiritual, mystical power. And anyone who drank from it, just like Mary's small alabaster chalice, if you drank from it, you would be cured from all ills or could achieve immortality. Now, both of these items were written about by early Christians. And people believe that if they found them, they would have possession of uh, remarkable artifacts. Now, originally, both of these items were referred to on, by the name engrail. And engrail means a most holy object. It was usually used to refer to items that had belonged to people associated with the Bible, like the, uh, a ring that had once belonged to the King Solomon from the Old Testament, or the um, the sword that King David in the Old Testament is said to have used to slay the giant Goliath. These items were all referred to as engrails. But eventually only these two items, the cup used by Mary Magdalene and the cup used by Joseph and Matthias to collect drops of Christ's blood after or during the crucifixion, were the ones that eventually only referred to as engrail or shortened to the grail now so originally in christian legend there were two holy grails items cups that had once possessed jesus's blood and if you found them you'd have a mirac miraculous artifact on your hands eventually in the middle ages when lots of tales were written about the holy grail some of them associated with king arthur because it is said that King Arthur becomes ill and his knights set out on a quest to discover the Holy Grail. And when they find it, they bring it back and he drinks from it and he's cured. And then it's hidden again. Now, in the original stories, some of them have it being the cup used by Jesus at the Last Supper, and some of them have it being this cup used by Mary Magdalene. But during the medieval period, when stories became more and more chauvinistic, women heroes were taken out of the equation. And instead, we end up with just the males being given prominent positions in the stories. So it's Joseph's cup, the cup of the Last Supper, that becomes the important item. And Mary Magdalene's chalice is completely forgotten about. And it was this chalice of Mary Magdalene that I decided to find out what had happened to it and it's my search for that that is written about in the book, The Chalice of Magdalene. I'm not going to ask you if you found it, though, because, I mean, I'd be spoiling the book, right, if I did ask that? Well, no, okay. I don't mind. If the book came out a long time ago, I don't mind telling you that, yes, what happened is I discovered that in the medieval period, in the 1200s, a family that lived at a place called Whittington Castle in the centre of England claimed to have had this cup they claimed to have, it was it had it had a long history to it there was a roman empress who went to jerusalem and apparently found it there in the third in the 300s it was then handed on to other people in her family when the roman empire collapsed it along with other holy items was brought to britain and it ended up in this family's possession that lived at this whittington castle in the center of england now they couldn't prove they had it, but they started boasting that they did have it. And I thought, well, OK, they claim to have had it. Maybe they did have some item that they believed to have been Mary Magdalene's chalice. What, you know, what did they do with it? What I found really interesting was that the castle they lived in is known locally as the White Castle because it is built from light coloured sandstone. And it stands, as I said, in a little village called Whittington, which 
in old English means white town, Whittington, white town. Now, in the earliest Arthurian stories of the Grail Castle, where Arthur's knights go searching for the Holy Grail, the, ho the Grail Castle, where the Grail is kept, is said to be the White Castle in the White oh, Town. Wow. So there was an actual white castle in a white town where people claimed to have had this car before these romances were written. So I thought, oh, wow, I've got to find out what happened to it. It turns out that in the mid 1800s, there was a historian from that area who, by the name of Thomas Wright, who claimed well, he was a descendant of these people, the Peveril family, that once lived in this castle. And he claimed that this cup had been handed on from generation to generation and that he still had it. But because he had no children to hand it on to, and he was also, was also an awfully rich guy, he decided to hide it and leave his own trail of clues as to where it was. And this consisted of a number of things but one that one of the final clues was a stained glass window that he had installed in the local church that he went to he paid for and had it designed and had it installed in the church and he claimed that this held the clues as to where it was hidden so i followed these clues and eventually was led to a statue of an eagle in some caves uh, nearby that was right in the middle of this hill i mean you have to go through old tunnels and uh, through brambles and all sorts of things to get to this cave and inside this cave in the base of this eagle statue that was discovered um, I didn't discover it somebody else had already done that but I managed to trace their descendants and they still had it in their loft um, and this what they found they didn't even know what it was they said well we think what, what was found there in the 1920s in the middle of this cave was in fact uh, an old Victorian mustard pot or something they said it was so simple looking and i said well you know i think it might be more important than that could i borrow it and take it to the british museum for analysis and i did and i didn't go to the british museum and said you know is this the holy grail or what <laughs> i just went to them and said this was found under rather unusual circumstances could you tell me what it is and they immediately said that is a roman scent jar Oh. And they looked at it and when they examined it further, they said it's a Roman scent jar and it's around 2000 years old. And based on the kind of stone that it's made from, which incidentally was green alabaster, it probably came from somewhere around the area of Palestine. 2000 years old from the area of Palestine. That's exactly when Jesus and Mary Magdalene are said to have lived where they oh, came wow. from. So anyway, I don't know. We cannot prove um, that it is the cup that once belonged to Mary Magdalene. It it certainly seems to have been the cup that the people in the Middle, Age, Middle Ages believed was it. And I believe because of the castle that they lived in was the white castle in the white town. It was the same, the same family in their possession of this cup, which initiated the Arthurian Grail oh, legends. Wow. So I may have a cup that belonged to Mary Magdalene. It's certainly old enough and comes from the right place. But I believe it is the cup that actually started the um, started the, the the Grail romances, and if you want to see it, oh, you have it on you. I okay. brought it. Along. I, I borrowed it especially oh, for this show. Oh, so cool! I very seldom show people this, but it doesn't. It literally it looks like an old egg. Oh cup. wow! But it, it, if you look at uh, many Roman scent jars, they have this same look to them. I'm trying to. There you go. Put it oh, in front yeah. of the camera. Right, right there we go. Um, it once had a lid to it, um, and um, there it is. It doesn't look like people have said, "Oh, well, it doesn't look like much." I mean, we expected some kind of gold, jewel encrusted thing, but um, well, you'd imagine somebody who came from. Well, it's like in, in the Indiana Jones film. He said, "This is a cup of a carpet." Yeah, he the, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, this was supposed to be a scent jar, and it is said to have held Jesus's blood. I mean, I've drank from it. I was going to ask you that too. Oh, I, I was going to ask if you drank from it because that'd be the first thing I did. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So anyway, uh, it still belongs to the people who's uh, who's uh, the descendants of the guy who found it in the 1920s after the other guy had hidden it. It might sound a lot to take in all that, but the way I've done my website, if you just clicked on the book cover on the front front page of my website, 
there's about 10 or 12 pages there all about this story. You don't even have to buy the book. You can just look it up on, on my website. It tells you the whole story, plus all the pictures of these places, plus the White Castle, the clues that this guy had left in the 1800s, the, um, you know, the, the, the thing itself. That's the actual book. But if you actually just go on the website, um, it, it's all there. That's Everything so cool. about it, plus all the... If you go down further, if you go down the page to the bottom... Oh, yeah, I it. see it right here. And then you click on those numbers, pages one, two, three. You'll find there all the, um, you know, tells about there's pictures of Mary Magdalene, paintings, paintings with us, with the cup she's supposed to have had. There's an illustration of the Romans taking it out of, out of um, Rome when Rome was sacked by the barbarians. There's an illustration of it from this guy's book. Oh wow! And the whole thing's it's, there. It's so there you go. The same is for all my books. I mean, I've tried to make my website journalist friendly, really. A lot of people just don't tell you the whole story about anything about their books on their websites because they want people to go out and buy the books. Well, I'm, I always put pretty much the whole story there in abbreviated form with photographs and everything. Um, I might be a bit silly because I'm probably doing myself out of sales <laughs> for the book. But anyway, there's the books. There's the some of the clues that this guy led and left and everything but this can this i did well before anything like the um the the da vinci code came out i mean this was this came out in 92 the da vinci code was around about 2000 and i remember a lot of people at the time journalists were saying to me well you've just been copying the da vinci code no the da vinci code mm -hmm. copied me it seems that way uh i want to ask you something about this adventure that you had to do this you know um I know some people are sitting there right now thinking the same thing I'm thinking, like, wow, you know, what's it like to be to uh, to organize this? And, you know, you probably meet a lot of people. What was the journey like for you um, doing this whole investigation? Well, it's really fascinating because a lot of the research I do is not me digging up things and doing archaeology. I'm not an archaeologist. Um, what I'll do is go to archaeologists and find out what they have already done. And the thing about archaeologists is they tend to not... If, if something they've found out connects with an historical figure that is connected with King Arthur or Robin Hood or something like that, because everybody just assumes that these people were, were, were mythical characters and made up, they don't like to associate their name with anything to do with King Arthur, even though they might find evidence that... He wasn't a historical figure. The same is true about the Holy Grail and things like this. To say, oh, we don't get involved in that. It will upset the church. It will upset the academic community. So they've got a lot of research that these guys are sitting on to help find this stuff out. Um, but it's my, I kind of look at it as my job to persuade them to tell me what it is. And then I'll go to some other archaeologist or historian who's done a lot of research into something and piece these things together because these guys never talk to each other, they keep their own research secret and then they publish just what they know about a particular site and a particular place or a particular time. They've never looked at the research somebody else has been doing. They probably haven't got the time. But what I can do is piece all these different bits together like a, a jigsaw puzzle and try and find some overall um, pattern to it. And that's tends, that tends to be how I manage to solve things that others don't. That's, that's excellent. It's like... Uh... A modern it says on your website it's like a modern day Indiana Jones kind of I could man that would be so cool I want to do I want to go out and do an adventure now let's go I'm ready <laughs> I actually had I the, the, if you have if, if, if you have anybody ever gets hold of the box set of the Indiana Jones films there was like four mm -hmm. of them weren't there um, and there's a box set with them all in it what Lucas films did when they produced that box set is to have an, an extra, you know, they have extra discs in these things with other stuff on it. Well, they they made a documentary for the box set. It was shown on Discovery Channel and things like that in the past, but it's in the box set and it was made by Lucasfilms and they wanted to find historians, archaeologists or whatever who had searched for the things that Indiana Jones did, the Ark of the Covenant, those stones that came from India, the crystal skull. And they came to me because they said, well, you're the only person we know who claims to have a holy grail. So I was interviewed for this. So I was actually, there's this whole documentary about me being like, you know, about half an hour of the two hour thing, following me, looking for this. And uh, 
the when when they were when I saw it the way that you know because I was just interviewed and when I described how I found these various clues that helped me find the uh, the cup um, it was incredibly similar to the sort of clues that Indiana Jones was following when he was looking for it in the film and I thought that I, I couldn't I can't I can't remember whether the Indiana Jones film came out after my book in 1992 that's the the third film the lost did. crusade or not but i'm i was wondering I, I think that somebody must have whoever was involved in writing that must have at some point um read my book and been inspired by it because it's just too I, similar honestly i'm i'm gonna read it anyway they described me as a real life indiana jones george lucas himself wow, has said it that's so cool <laughs> i mean i look i love george lucas and all of his work man so you, man you've got so many cool uh stories here um i didn't get a chance to ask you about the marion conspiracy did it go along with the other book or is it another conspiracy on its own the marion conspiracy is a completely different thing again that was written yeah, There's you were dog going running again. around again. Um, the Marion Conspiracy, or that was its original title, but it's published in America under the title The Virgin Mary Conspiracy, which makes it more sense. Um, Marion just means of Mary. It's to do with the Virgin Mary uh, and her tomb. Um, in Jerusalem, in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, there is a tomb that the Catholic Church claimed to be the tomb of the Virgin Mary for years and for centuries. I mean, what, going way back to the founding of the Catholic Church in the third in the fourth century, right up until the 19th, uh, the 20th century, this tomb was a site of for pilgrimage and people from all over the world came along and paid good money or gave donations to go to the tomb where the Virgin Mary was supposed to be buried. Now, the Bible itself doesn't tell us where the what happened to the Virgin Mary. That's Jesus's mother. What happened to her? A different person, incidentally, to Mary Magdalene, who is Jesus's friend. Not, if the Bible doesn't say what happened to the Virgin Mary after Jesus's death. She's staying with one of the disciples in Jerusalem, but we're not told anything else about her. And <clears throat> all the stories about what became of her are all legends that grew up in during the period of early Christianity. Now, so it was pretty much when the Catholic Church was founded in by the Romans in the 300s, they pretty much left it up to the individual churchgoer to decide whether what happened to the Virgin Mary. Now, some of these legends said that she was so holy that like Jesus, she ascended bodily to heaven. So therefore, there couldn't be a tomb of hers on the earth you couldn't have a body of the virgin mary if she descended to heaven so some people held to this idea and some people said well as the bible doesn't say anything about what happened to her we think she could be buried in a tomb like anyone else so the catholic world was pretty much split between these two ideas and it was left up to the individual churchgoer to decide what they believed but in 1950 the Pope at the time suddenly decided he was going to make it um, canon law, Catholic law, for all Catholics to believe that the Virgin Mary ascended bodily to heaven. Now, fine. So people who had perhaps been thinking she was buried somewhere suddenly had to say, OK, well, I have to believe now that she ascended bodily to heaven. But what were they going to do about this tomb in Jerusalem that the Catholic Church had been making fortune out you know they did have, they've been making a fortune out of it for years do they suddenly sort of say now oh sorry it's, we're closing it it's um <laughs> we, we you know Return we've got it money. wrong <laughs> what about everybody who asked you know everybody asking for their money back so there was a whole conspiracy that was actually created by the catholic church firstly to try and shut the pope up and make him not say anything, not decide about this idea about the Virgin Mary ascending to heaven, but he wouldn't be shut up. So then they had to try and make out, somehow try and get rid of this tomb. So anyway, there was a lot of um, stuff went on and people went disappearing and people were 
um, were excommunicated and all sorts of things about this. So that's what that book's about. But what was fascinating <laughs> about that book is that when it came out, um, it got a lot of publicity all over the place. And in Italy, it appeared, because obviously Italy being a very Catholic country and being where the Pope is, um, th there was a great deal of publicity about it there. And the headlines of one of the newspapers in Rome had said, had, had said all about my book and what I was proposing. And I suddenly got a phone call one night from some guy in Italy, from some journalist, to, uh, asking me in broken English. He said, do you realize, Mr. Phillips, that you have been excommunicated? Oh, my God. I said, what? Said, yeah, the Pope's excommunicated you. I said, what do you mean it's excommunicated? I'm not even a Catholic. How can I be excommunicated? I'm not communicated. And he said, well, apparently it turns out that there are certain books that the Catholic Church do not want being read or being in the libraries oh. of Catholic schools. And so what they do is they make a list of this book isn't, we shouldn't have this in Catholic schools. This shouldn't be in the library in a Catholic school. But somehow within the sort of legal system of the, of the Vatican, anyone who appears on this list is automatically excommunicated. And they're not going to bother to check out whether you're a Catholic or not. If you are one, you're going to be really worried because it means no. you're going to hell. But if you're not, well, it don't really matter. So they think, well, it doesn't really matter. We'll just excommunicate people en masse. So if ever I decided I wanted to take up the cloth, I'd uh, well, I'd first have to be forgiven by the Pope oh, himself. Wow. That so is, wow. That's, that's a big pill to swallow right there. Ah, oh, my. But that was the, that was the, that was the second that was uh, that was the second time I had um, I had a run in oh. with the Pope, the same Pope. This was Pope John Paul the second, the one from Poland. Um, I had a run in with him a few year, a couple of years before a few years before that, with my book about the the Holy Grail, the the uh, the uh, Chalice of Magdalene, um, because that again got publicity all over the place. It was even in Newsweek. But in Italy, it got a particular amount of publicity. And when people were seeing that some guy in England claims to have found the Holy Grail, they must have assumed that I was talking about the cup of the Last Supper because most people were unaware of the Mary Magdalene connection and the, and the chalice that she was supposed to have had. And so what they did was to um, loads of different churches throughout Italy and Spain and other Catholic countries were saying, no, this guy in England hasn't got the Holy Grail. We've got it in our church. And there was a cathedral saying, no, we have it here. And there was like about a dozen, 12 or more people claiming to have this Holy Grail, plus some big guy who was who sort of like rather scared me, he claimed to be head of the night, a modern order of Knights Templars, oh. who had another little chalice. He said, no, this is it. This is it. And so there was such a sort of furore about this that one of the journalists from some paper in some uh, newspaper in, in in rome went to the vatican and said there's so many this guy in england's claimed to have found the grail and loads of other people are claimed to have it which one is it which one's the real one and the answer was that his holiness will read this book from this guy in england he will evaluate these other claims and he will give his answer in his address at the end of the week and apparently every i think it's friday afternoon he comes out onto the balcony of the vatican and he kind of makes proclamations or every couple of weeks or whenever he does it i'm not catholic so i don't know but the next time he's due to appear on his balcony above st peter's square he'll say which one of them's real i thought I can't. so i got journalists all over the world contacting me about that what do you say about the pope he's gonna he's reading your book what do you think he's gonna say um, people were coming to me claiming they wanted to buy this thing. And I said, well, it's not mine to sell. Um, it just went on and on. And then eventually at the end of the week, suddenly all this Ferrari kind of finished when the Pope came out on the Vatican balcony and said, none of these are the real one because we've got it in the Vatican. What? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so I then I wrote, I said, I need, an, I need an audience with the Pope. So I actually wrote to the Vatican and said to them which which cup have you got that you you never claimed this before that the, no pope has ever said before that that the that the, the um the grail is in the vatican which grail i mean you're talking about the cup of the last supper or the mary magdalene cup i mean because that i haven't i'm not talking about the cup of the last supper and eventually i got a, 
I got an invitation from a cardinal to visit them in the Vatican Library. And he said, um, oh, no, he, he, he said that the, the, the Pope, the one we've got is the one, the cup of the Last Supper. So we don't know anything about yours. But I was given a tour around the Vatican archives. Oh, my. I thought, I thought, I, and I remember saying to them, well, surely, um, <laughs> surely I'm not supposed to see all this. I mean, this is the secret archives of the Vatican that's supposed to have all sorts of documents that no one's allowed to see. He said, most of the stuff in here is just filing requisitions and, and orders for paper clips. And they were just in boxes piled up. They, I mean, there was no order to this stuff. So I was given a tour around the secret archives of the Vatican. But I mention all this and, the, and, the, and this Ferrari with the Pope in my book, The the Marian Conspiracy, as it was published in England, or The Virgin Mary Conspiracy in America. Oh, wow. Um, did you did you ask them anything about them having the, uh, the Grail, though, when you were there? Like, did they say, oh, you know, we have it back here somewhere or... No, so this is the this was the thing. I wanted to be shown around the museum, and if they've got that, it would be in the sort of locked parts or the vaults under the museum where they've got statues and paintings and stuff. Not what was the library to do with it? So I think they didn't let. When I sort of said to this cardinal librarian, I said to him, "Can I actually go and have a look at this cup?" He says, "He said to be quite honest, I don't think they know where oh, it is." Okay. It's just down there somewhere. You it's amazing. Everybody thinks the fact. So there are conspiracies, maybe. The what, the conspiracy I write about in the Virgin Mary conspiracy happened in the 1950s. The kind of conspiracies that most people talk about in the Vatican, like keeping secret various papers or archives or artifacts, I don't think they're keeping it secret at all. I think they don't know where half of the stuff is. Yeah, it's probably mountains There's something down there. like 20 miles of yeah. shelving contain 20 miles of shelving containing documents that aren't even aren't even um, uh, you know they're not they're not even on any kind not of sorted. database. They're not sorted or anything. They're just down there. No, huh. not sorted. The the very important things are like maybe the the the, the papal document that excommunicated. Um, Galileo or something or Henry the eighth but most of this stuff that people claim oh the Vatican will never show us this the reason they don't show you is they don't know where it is I wonder how many employees they have because that that'd be a huge undertaking trying to sort not that. many this is it he, this is one of the things he was telling me all about my, my first few chapters of the uh, the Virgin Mary conspiracy are all about my visit to the Vatican and um, it's it's incredible that most of the time he was telling he was showing me how much work they have to do and uh, this guy was like one of the chief librarians and he only had like six people working for him and this place is about the size of the what's that place in washington where all the uh, archives library are library of congress yeah it's about oh, that wow. big and he got six people working for it and most of them are part-time because they have to go and do you know they're priests they do services and a couple of nuns or whatever that's it hmm. man the vatican isn't it like everybody's cracked it up to so, me. So well, there could be a lot of good stuff down there and it's just kind of hanging out, collecting dust, really. That's fascinating to think about. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's so cool, man. Oh my goodness. That's so cool. I want, you, I'd feel so lucky if I got to go do that. That must be so cool. What's it look like there? I have to ask this. What did it look like inside? Uh, the walls and stuff? Big room or was it small or the area they had you? In the go around the Vatican to the parts that are open to the public, it's magnificent. And the parts that are open to when they have, um, you know, various um, formal occasions. But when you go, when you go to the actual main library of the Vatican, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's got uh, paintings on the wall by the great masters and it's got statues by famous people and you name it. But when you actually go to the, the area that I went in, it's just brick. It's just ordinary red brick walls. Um, it's and, and then out the back of it, there's all these porter cabins. You know what? You call, what I don't know what you call them in America. Trailers <laughs> with you know these kind of portable buildings where they've got a lot of stuff stored. Mm. You don't see that on the TV. No. You don't get that in no. the TV. <laughs> they make it look like it's some you know big castle all the way through with guards everywhere. So, well, Graham. 
There are guards, but the guards out the back are much meaner looking than those, the Swiss guards. They are all Swiss guards, but everyone thinks, oh, they just dress up in this weird outfits, but they're pretty mm, tough lot. I could imagine. It'd be a little intimidating, especially that, that one guy who called you claiming to be from a new uh, order of the Knights Templar. That, that would spook me a little bit, I have to say. <laughs> I did at the time. I thought you'd come mm. and get me. Um, well, Graham, it's been great talking to you, and um, I want to make sure I tell the guests one more time how to uh, reach out and get your books. And, uh, you know, you do provide a lot of information on your website's front page, um, and you can click them and read, you know, a good amount of it. But um, I want my viewers to uh, support you and order some hard copies and uh, take a look into this stuff because we cover this kind of uh, – we've covered, you know, ancient mysteries and strangeness and uh, – you know, you've, you're such a great um, author and you've, you've been through so much, so many adventures. You got to gr grab this copy and open it up and really read it and uh, get, you know, get in there and experience it, you know, the way you did. So I'm calling out to my viewers to go in and, and uh, order some and, and take a look. I'd love to have you back on in the future. Uh, I know you're a busy guy, though. Um, so when, uh, where, where can we see you coming up on television and uh, things like that? Do you do you have any dates or uh, shows that you'll be on coming up that we I, can look at? I I don't know the dates yet, but the current series of Ancient Aliens, and I'm quite I'm on quite a lot of them. I mean, it's quite a lot of the episodes. Um, and I've got there's an, a show, I, uh, a documentary that I was filmed for some weeks ago, which should be coming out sometime during this fall on this Smithsonian channel, and it's all about um, the Holy Grail. And it's all about my, you know, the search for the Holy Grail I've been talking about. So that should be out on the Smithsonian channel pretty soon. But um, if you go onto my website, grahamphillips.net, on the front page, as part from having the books that you can go and, you know, look at like you were talking about, at the top, there's a link to my Facebook, if anybody wants to join my Facebook page. And also up there, there's a link to on the top of the page, there's a link to my uh, YouTube channel thing. It's not a channel like this, but it's all, there's a list there. I've, wherever possible, wherever I've, wherever I've found online, people have uploaded episodes of programs I've been in on YouTube. There's a list that, that all, they're all okay. there somewhere on the front great, page. Great. Um, it just says Graham's YouTube channel or something at the top of that page oh, on the, the front page it. somewhere. There it is. So if you click on that YouTube, then there's a list on the somewhere of all the in things. The tiny language. There's, there's dozens of them. Well, I'm gonna. I mean, I haven't uploaded them all. I've just found other people that okay, have uploaded great. them. Okay, great. Great. So guys, get out there, search it out, and you know, um, get in there and read about this stuff, and uh, you know, tell people about it. You know, get the knowledge out there because this, you know, this is just all. Uh, excellent and fascinating okay Graham um, thank you uh, and we definitely will reach out to you in the future and uh, you know whenever you can uh, if, if you have some free time just let us know and we just appreciate you coming on so much and giving us your time and especially showing us the cup that was just uh, fascinating well thank you very much for having me on I'd love well, to be we'll, on again we'll get you in sir all right it was great meeting you talk to you soon bye 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 all right, guys, um, I, I'm, you know how when I have interviews, you know, you guys see me all the time. This is what I should say. You guys see me on here all the time, and I just talk and talk. This, I just got so much good information out of this uh, episode, out of this interview. Um, I'm going to have to take it in. I can just, oh, man, I got to go back to his webpage because, look, seriously, you guys go to uh, GrahamPhillips.net. Uh, it's all you got to type in, and there'll be a link in the About section. There's been links dropped throughout the broadcast, but when you go down and you click on the book, like we said, um, you know, not only is it set up to uh, give you large parts of it, but there's uh, all the pictures and everything in here. Like, you know me, I make videos, and I can just see detailing some of this a little bit, and then uh, working into some really good videos because I didn't know about a lot of these mysteries. I knew he wrote a lot of books. I knew about the Shakespeare. I knew loosely about the Shakespeare and Robin Hood one, and I didn't know about all these other ones. And it's just so good, man. Like, it's like a YouTube video about a, about these conspiracies times a billion. Like, 
just the way it's written. So I urge you all, uh, like I do with uh, all the guys we have in, you know, from Ancient Aliens and all the authors, you know, really do make an attempt to check out their stuff. Uh, you won't be disappointed with Graham. I'd heard so many people reached out to me before before today um, talking about Graham and, uh, you know, saying how excited they were to hear what he had to say about this stuff. So, I mean, he's he's been through a lot, man. Like, at first you read on his front page, um, you know, he's described as a historical detective. And I, I didn't know it, that he'd gone, you know, so done so much good work with it it's just excellent um i meant to have you guys ask some questions and i'm sorry i always go over because i always i have so many things to say on the first interviews but graham said he'd come back and you know i'm gonna deliver just like reverend carter said he would um we're gonna get everybody back in and i'm gonna make sure that we have our moderator set up and everything set to be able to get your um questions answered and um get all this uh set up taking and taken care of man i'm just like in my head still picturing uh the fervor that would have been created about the uh the pope and i can just see like you know we see videos when the when the pope's going to make a small announcement there's millions of people that are just you know jumping all over the place you know it huge lines huge crowds i could imagine making a especially after all the stuff about the holy grail and the movies that have been around in the last 10 years i could imagine the the hype and the fervor that happened there <laughs> and i'm still reeling over that guy oh man he called saying he was a knight templar i wonder i know i know i'm conspiratorial i know what you guys are saying uni don't go there i'm going there i wonder if he was a real uh templar or if, at least if he thought he was i wonder if that guy at least thought he was a real templar Sorry, I had to turn on your chat. I forgot to turn it on in the beginning. Anyway, oh man. Oh man. Oh, such good stuff. I'm sorry. I was going to pull your chat up, but I was giving myself a second to process before I pulled your chat over here and talked to you. Because <laughs> you know I do that at the end of every live show, but man. I'm just reeling with, all the, with everything I just heard. So good. And the stuff about Robin Hood. Oh man. Okay, I got the chat over here. I so if I miss anything you guys say, please email me. I'm sorry. I'm just I have so many ideas. I'm inspired. That's what it is. I'm inspired by the just the feeling of adventure that, you know, and uh, a like so many people don't do anything. Like so many people sit around and criticize YouTubers and criticize people and they don't accomplish a lot and to think of everything Graham's accomplished out there. And he just got he just went out and did it it's just such an awesome story so i'm just a little i'm i'm collecting myself okay uh, i'm looking for your uni rock signs too thank you and graham for taking the time to do this for us it was great says the kind guy hey you're welcome my friend you know um i'm getting graham back in for sure and we'll do a q a or something i mean if you guys email me if i get a few questions emailed and you guys do have things you want me to ask him and you email unirocktv at gmail.com Maybe the next interview could be a QA. and a um, You know, and also, that was the first time I talked to Graham. So, as it goes on, I'll become a little more organized in my head. You know what I'm saying? The first time you meet anybody, it's just, you're, you're trying to figure everything out and all that. And with all, you know, all that good information on the Grail, I didn't even know. Man, that's so cool, man. Oh, tell him to come back, says Unirage. He's coming back. I always make sure I invite everyone back. That Well, every good interview, you know, and that was one, probably, if not the best, one of the best interviews I've had right there. And I didn't even get, to, I didn't even ask a lot because Graham just has so much good um, stuff to talk about. I mean, if I was to go detail the videos I've made up to now and talk to someone about them, I could talk for a little while, right? But man, I wouldn't say probably like, one or two things that were as good as the stuff he had to say and it was the whole hour i mean that was like the that was like seeing a really good youtube video times 50 the stuff he had to say all right let me see if you guys have anything else great show fascinating content as always great job reality check my bro hey anytime dude i'm glad you guys are here thanks for showing up and supporting us i'm i apologize for not having your chat up i had some connection issues in the beginning um i 
I'd called and uh, messaged him on Skype and nothing was going through and then all of a sudden everything went through and then we got connected so I tried to jump in real quick so I apologize for that uh, oh yeah make sure you guys stop by Graham's webpage I'm gonna drop a link right now that you can just click and also it's gonna be in the about section please seriously um, you know we've we've all been through a lot together we've all like hung and talked and you know we're all friends here so I wouldn't steer you wrong. I think you got the feeling from just hearing him talk. You know, you won't be disappointed. Tracy says unique interviews. So, so good, right? Such a good, so many good topics. Tonight at 6 p.m. Yes, thank you, Affected Collective. See now, I've got so much, I, I'm, I've got the desire to create now, you know? Like I wanna make a video or I wanna go out and, you know, do a backflip or go explore in a, a forgotten cave somewhere like, I'm not thinking correctly, but tonight we have David Sarita coming in. I hope I, I never say anyone's name right, so I hope David's not watching. He's like, that uni rocks never says my name right. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> I'm horrible with names. But yeah, 6 p.m., another interview. And it's going to be a good one, too, okay? So hopefully you guys can stop back for that. Kind guy, this was a great show. No worries. Oh, hey, it's all good, man. Tracy likes his passion. Very unique. Another great moment with Unirox as Dead GPK. And on, hey, and because of you guys, you know, like, uh, I wouldn't be able to get the interviews if it wasn't for you guys subscribing and watching and sharing and all those things you do. So, um, you know what I say at the end of the episodes? Um, make sure, I, I was going to mention my Patreon page, but you know what? Check out, um, check out his webpage. Check out his books before you uh, look at my stuff. Because it was just too good, guys. So awesome. Just the fact that he was nice enough to take the time out of his his schedule and come talk to us. And we'll get him back in. So anyway, let me go ahead and round this out. Because, I, hey, Affected Collective just reminded me. I've got another interview coming up. i got to go get ready for it. It does take a little bit of time to get these set up. And I want to make sure I have time to compile all that good stuff in here. Write notes on the cool stuff that I thought would make, you know... Maybe I could mention parts to hit the interview in another video. I want to write all that out and get ready for David Sarita to, Sarita, Sarita to come in. Um, so until he does at 6 p.m., be nice in the comments, y'all. Those are people on the other side. So you always have to be kind. Just never be afraid to speak your mind. And be back here at 6 p.m. Eastern or New York time for Unirock, another patented Unirock interview. I'm going to patent them. I'm going to file it with the patent office. That way no one else can do it. <laughs> and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you, guys. I can't wait to see you tonight. So let's get out of here. Let's go.